Hello everyone, Loremaster Sotek here with a new video as I am celebrating the last day of insane Texas summer heat, at least as far as the forecast seems to be showing for the coming weeks. It looks like this is uh, the day you'll be watching this is the last day of triple digit temperatures, which I'm so thankful for. It's been so hot. I'm just melting. But in any event, let's go ahead and hop straight into what I want to talk about for today's video which is going to be, let's have a sit down and talk about Kislev. And when I say Kislev, I do not mean for the Shadows of Change DLC. I think I've said everything that needs to be said about Shadows of Change, though I would love to hear how y'all are finding it. So if you like, want to leave a comment for this video, it'd be really cool uh, down below. If you are playing Shadows of Change, I'd love to hear how you're finding it so far. But in any event, I spent some time just playing the other Kislev campaigns to kind of get all of my thoughts into place because while I think that Creative Assembly did some pretty interesting things with Grand Cafe and for the most part they feel notably better to me although not everyone agrees on it but I like the that they're experimenting with it Kislev feels like not really any major steps were taken so I kind of wanted to come over and uh, recommend some ideas for how Kislev could be made a bit more interesting to make what features they do have more fun to play with. So I let's just hop into it. First things first, uh, when looking at the faction mechanics that everyone has access to, the only thing that I really want to talk about are the generic hags very, very briefly, and then the ice court system. So for the generic hags, uh, the only thing I really think they're missing that I would like to see with them is that they don't have any unique traits. Uh, currently, they literally just have the generic traits from, I guess, the start of Warhammer 3 or even the older games. Uh, though the traits like have been improved over time, I actually think they're just most of the original Total War Warhammer 1 traits. So it would be very, very, very nice to see them get updated with some unique ones to their faction i find it pretty weird that they didn't get any especially because i mean i can understand that a lot of the traits are kind of specific to the patriarch because the patriarch is the only generic hero that kislev has that gets regular traits right the ice witch has kind of the ice court system so they don't really have any pre-designed uh generic traits for them only the patriarch does so i could see how there maybe wasn't anything there for the hag witches but you figured they would have added something for the hag witches as part of the dlc but uh i would very much recommend uh getting them some unique traits hopefully we'll get hag mothers at some point uh preferably in the near future not the far future and there can be some kind of overlap there but it would be very very nice to help them get a lot of unique flair you know things just off the top of my head it'd be really nice to see uh maybe some traits that are about buffing the ungoal centric units so a lot of your um cossars or giving various bonuses when dealing with uh chaos factions or various bonuses when you're fighting in territory controlled by kislev or various bonuses that uh, make your curses more effective so you know things that like maybe make your buffs and debuffs more powerful or allow them to get more winds of magic or make their spells cheaper you know just things like that um i i think there's a lot of fun ways they could be explored you know definitely traits that maybe make them cause uh like damage to enemy leadership because they're so spooky and scary and stuff or buffs to spirit unit so like they give buffs to the uh the beowulves or the things in the woods the um incarnate elemental of beasts and then the elemental bear you know like those all i think would be reasonable uh just there's a lot of things they could do and it really feels like just kind of nothing's there so i that is definitely something that needs to happen the other thing that i think needs to happen for kind of all of them is the ice court training the ice court training in theory was a really cool idea it's a great mechanic i honestly think that allows you to get heroes that have significantly more going on with them at an early level and although sometimes 
you can get some bad rolls and not necessarily get an ice witch or an ice maiden that you really want most of the time you're going to get a pretty decent character out of it right at the start however the problem that I have with it, and that a lot of people have with it, is that it's so specific to the ice court that it feels really weird whenever you're playing anyone but Katarin. Like, it's kind of an eh system when you're playing as Kostaltin, or as Mother Ostenka, or even Boris, where you have these characters who the ice court would not be lending out, you know, necessarily their absolute best and brightest to. So I would really like to see this mechanic adjusted so that it is unique for every single Kislev faction. So for instance, Katarin should stay the exact same. Katarin is, she's the big bad of the ice court. She's the Zarina. You know, she should have the system exactly as it is. Don't change anything. Kostaltin should be completely different. Kostaltin should be that instead of the ice court training system, he has like the great orthodoxy training or something along those lines or like cultiverse and training, whatever you want to call it. And the way his should work is that your hero option are patriarchs and your Lord options are boyars. So instead of doing the whole system of, uh, you know, you going through the tech tree, unlocking the techs for the ice switches, and then you get access to them. Instead, it should work the exact same, it's just that those texts should be rewritten so that they instead give you... I would still have it that, like, if they wanted to make it easier on themselves, you could still make it where those texts give you bonuses to how many ice switches you can have. Though I would also heavily, I would heavily, heavily, heavily recommend adding... Um, actually, you know what? No, no, they shouldn't. No, they should just make it where, like, you get one free Ice Maiden, and uh, you can have as many Ice Witches as you want, and then the way you get more Ice Maidens, and the way you recruit them uh, for the non-Ice uh, Court factions, is by building, like, the appropriate building. For me, I would make it the uh, the building for the, um, the Ice Guard. So, the Ice Guard, they are, like, the they're kind of functionally the enforcers and protectors of the ice witches. They are trained by the ice witches. They're even an all female warrior order. So that should be the building where you get ice mains from. Uh, it is a tier four structure though. Personally, I really think that structure could go down to being tier three, like a tier three to tier four building instead of a tier four to tier five building. It feels a little over ridiculous having it as high up as it is in my opinion, but I think that would be the appropriate place to put Ice Maidens, where, you know, if you build the base version, it allows you to recruit Ice Maidens normally, and then when you build the big version, it gives you plus one slot. That way you're able to get as many Ice Maidens as you want. Now, this would mean that the Ice Maidens would also need to get generic, uh, or sorry, they need to get Kislev-specific traits added to them. Uh, so, you know, while we're making the Hag traits, we can also make the Ice Witch and Ice Maiden traits. You can just do all of them at once, and that'll make life a lot easier. That way, we have a system where if you're playing with Katarin, you get the absolute best and brightest and the most powerful of all of the Ice Witches and Ice Maidens. And if you're playing as Kostaltin, you get the best Patriarchs and Boyars, which is very, very fitting. You know, that is where he wields most of his authority is over the patriarchs and then the uh you know kind of the gospodar leaders so and you know have it where the patriarchs now have access to patriarch specific buffs um there will be some overlap you know you, you'll still have like oh scourge of the corrupt which gives you plus three uh bonus against corruption or the the control one that gives you plus three control like some of them can overlap between the various groups but, you know, instead of having the one where it's like, oh, you get a cooldown reduction on your spells, well, for the Patriarch, it would be you get a cooldown reduction on your prayers, you know, your abilities. Or instead of it being you draw in the Winds of Magic, uh, so you get a bonus to how, many, how much your Winds of Magic charges up, for the Patriarchs, it could instead be something like you reduce the Winds of Magic of enemies in the same province as you. You know, there, there are fun little ways you could have them be very similar systems, and you just add in little differences where you have to. Um, you know, where they have something like, 
uh, you get a bonus to all infantry units or all cavalry units. Well, you can leave that the exact same. That doesn't need to change. Or you give bonus to uh, missile damage or melee damage. Well, okay, that's pretty generic. That doesn't need to change. So there's not that many of them that need to be made unique uh, to fit the Patriarchs or the Boyars. Um, so anyway, so Kostaltin, his system should be about Boyars and... Um, Patriarchs, and I would do it the exact same as it currently is, where the you could uh, I would just switch the tech tree to whatever happens to be their focus. You get the tech for that character, uh, and that's when you can start you know recruiting them. So th like Kostaltin would not get access to generic patriarchs and generic boyars. He would have to make all of his patriarchs and boyars, just like Katarin does not get access to generic maidens. And Frost Witches, she has to make them. And, and in the same vein, Mother Ostankia should do hags. Um, so I would actually not bother with this feature until we get hag mothers. That way for Mother Ostankia, she's able to do the exact same thing where she gets hag witches and hag mothers that she is able to customize uh, to, you know, make them how she wishes and make them extra fun and powerful and stuff uh, instead of having the ice witches or the patriarchs and boyars and then for boy for boris um i would do a mix so for czar boris i would have it where he gets boyars yeah uniquely crafted boyar lords and then he gets ice maiden heroes uh which demonstrates his very unique relationship between um you know that he kind of has everybody uh circled behind him um, arguably you could do it where he has ice witches and patriarchs, but personally, like I would pick one or the other. I, I don't think it really matters. Like you could argue that, oh, well, Boris founded the great orthodoxy. So shouldn't he do patriarchs? And then he can have, uh, ice witch lords to kind of demonstrate that like the, the ice court seemed to favor Boris a little bit, but personally, I think it would kind of be the other way around where I feel like, uh, especially because he's kind of out in the wilderness a bit. It would make more sense for him to have like boyars, like these loyal lords who have followed him out into the chaos waste or what have you. And then, you know, the ice court gives him some support, but not as much as they give his daughter. So he only gets ice maidens. And then uh, I think that would work really, really well. And I think that would make that feature so much more fun for all the different factions while still not having to do a lot. Like, I don't think that requires that much effort. You can even have it use like the same artwork and stuff and you don't have to go as crazy. Like you could leave it in the tech tree where it still look like has the exact same art and exact same text and everything. It's just that. And you know, you could even make it where it still gives you access to, uh, it still gives you the more ability to recruit frost maidens and stuff. But personally, I would just adjust it. It shouldn't be a big deal to change the tech tree for three factions. Um, that's not that many. Uh, and I think that would go a long way to allowing the Kislev experience to still feel cohesive, but thematic to each of the characters. Uh, so yeah, that would be my kind of whole thing there. Uh, that would make, I think all of those characters a lot more fun. Uh, and you could even do some kind of unique things with like having it be with, uh, mother Ostankia. Like she has a ability. There are some things that would need to be adjusted. Like Mother Ostenga has an ability on her skill tree and her unique tree that allows her to recruit hags from anywhere. Um, so maybe instead of that, you could change it to being that the, you know, the duration that it takes to recruit new hags to the hag, the, you know, the daughters of the forest court system. <laughs> so like, you know, the ice court training, but instead for hags, you could have it where uh, the the skill from Mother Ostankia reduces it by two turns forever. So once she reaches that skill point and you get it, then any hag witches and hag mothers you recruit for the rest of the campaign take two less turns to train, uh, which I think would be completely reasonable and a lot of fun. So uh, that is it for the everybody factions. Everything else I'm going to talk about has to do with the old Kislevite faction. So we're not going to be talking about Mother Ostankia again. The next thing I want to talk about then is the Adamans. So for those who have not played Kislev recently, um, if ever, the original three Kislevite factions have a unique mechanic where for every two provinces they take, they gain an Adaman. 
and an adamant is basically a boyar lord that you can you can assign to one of your provinces and he basically starts with some pretty generic like he starts with some buffs you he starts with either reductions to corruption uh increases to income uh increases to growth and i think increases to control so he has four kind of like base stats and you get usually he's got like a mix of two of them or one of them is like really really strong so i think pretty much everybody almost always goes for like growth and income but you have some options uh and once you assign him to a province he basically just sits there for the rest of the campaign and passively provides buffs however every few turns you'll get a dilemma where he basically has kind of like leveled up and it gives him a new trait and this trait will usually be something like you can make it where he provides a bigger income buff or he gives you reductions to anyone recruiting troops in that province or it'll be something like he uh can gain a skill that'll help him in battle which that one's like he can get like foe seeker or deadly onslaught for instance which that one's pretty dumb because like he doesn't really fight very often uh the adamant the only way the adamant will ever fight is that he, it either the city can be attacked in which case he joins the garrison or you can recruit him as a lord but if you recruit him as a lord um he's literally just a regular boyar he's not different at all um and he also loses all of his kind of unique effects while he is a boyar so you're not really incentivized to recruit him the only reason you would ever recruit him uh, which i've done this is if you really want to try and make him a really powerful character so like you know like really upgrade his melee tree get him on a bear and everything that way when you assign him to a settlement he can be a much more competent um fighter should the city be attacked but it's pretty it's pretty basic um what i would do for the adamans and really heavily recommend is i think they should be made much closer to the caravan masters of grand cafe which seems to be the what was intended for them i just don't think it went as far as it needed to which is that they should have a skill tree like they should generate experience like yeah they they generate talents or traits i should say they generate traits um every number of turns that they're there but they should also just level up uh, just by defending the city like just sitting there now it shouldn't necessarily be especially quick obviously if the city is attacked they get a lot more experience and if you decide to recruit them um they offer a lot more now alternatively what i'll come back to that in a second but um i would really like to see them level up and get skill points and they should have a unique skill tree just like the caravan masters do where like they're recognizably like kind of like the boyars they have a lot of similarities to the boyars but the difference being that instead of a traditional blue skill tree they have a unique blue skill tree that is purely about buffing the city they're in um and it's like capabilities to defend itself and maybe along the top they have some additional unique buffs that have to do with their system as an adamin one of the things that i think would be really really cool to help them be far more than just kind of provincial governors but also more of like city defenders is that they should have skills that allow them to um they should be able to like add units to the garrison so they should get a system where uh, as they're leveling up either through the trait system or through uh, the skill point system they are able to invest skill points into something that like adds a unit uh, you know it's like oh if you get this skill point you add two units of zargard to the garrison or if you put a point into this skill you get a unit of bear cavalry into the garrison so like there are ways you can invest him to specialize into certain kind of troops and as he specializes he adds those to the garrison and they count as his army you know alternatively they could even do a system where you when you like you unlock an adamin you get to pick an adamin and then you recruit him and he's just like a unique lord that you assign to a city and his gimmick is mostly should in my opinion should be something like as long as he's garrisoned he has 100 upkeep reduction and he does not add 
to your army supplies. Um, instead, he's just like a completely free character who gets a completely free army as long as he stays in, uh, in the city. Like he can leave. Like you can, you can send him out of the city to attack someone or to do something. But if you do that, then he loses all his unique buffs because all because I'm and I'm pretty sure they could do this because like we have plenty of systems that are like you get this trait when defending in a city siege or something like that. So I would give him a bunch of abilities and unique skills that only work when he is defending in a siege battle. Um, uh, or, and yeah, just make it like that. Um, which would make him far more exciting, uh, because then you could really customize how you want him to defend a city and what is his focus. You know, do you decide to make him kind of a melee powerhouse? So he's running out and like killing like greater demons and the enemy characters and stuff, or instead, are you going to focus on his generalship abilities and like, what kind of units do you spec him into? Do you spec him more into being like a cavalry focused character where maybe he adds cavalry units to the garrison. So he adds like two units of Griffin Legion and a bear cav unit once he gets fully upgraded. And he also buffs them with like devastating flanker and some other stuff. Or do you go uh, like the melee route where he adds maybe two units of Zargard uh, and you know, um, some like armored Cossars and then he gives them all sorts of buffs. So maybe they get like charge defense against all and some other and like bonus ammunition stuff. Or do you focus him more into like a uh, war machine? So he adds like a little Grom unit and two, uh, armored war heavy, uh, war sled units. And he gives buffs to like how much ammunition they have and like their speed and charge bonuses and stuff like that. Or do you focus him into being like an infantry ranged character? So he gives buffs to like your, uh, ice guard and, uh, Strozzi units, in which case, you know, he gives all these like big missile damage buffs and like range increase to those units. Like there are so many fun ways to make this character more exciting. And, you know, give him the ability to, like, recruit heroes into the garrison. So, like, he gets a dilemma of does he side with the ice court, in which case he gets a ice maiden that joins the garrison, or does he side with the great orthodoxy, in which case he gets a patriarch in the garrison. Um, stuff like that. And, like, you know, maybe the one that he gets, they come with, like, some abilities unlocked, so they're a little fancier than the regular garrison heroes. So, like, oh, you went with the ice maiden? Well, she starts on a horse, and she also has the like she has four spells unlocked instead of just two and she also has the ability to summon an ice uh the uh, the ice links uh the ice cat cr critter thing and then uh the uh the patriarch's like oh well if you choose the patriarch he starts with uh two prayers instead of just one so he has urson's roar and he also has like the soliax lullaby because that's what everybody takes which is the heal or he has tor's ability so he can like um you know fix vigor and stuff and on top of that he also starts with like a special active weapon that makes him when he activates it he like does flaming damage for a little while or something i don't know like the males mace of hellstrom or something um, even though that's an empire item but you can get it with kislev super easy uh anyway so i just think that would make that character so much more exciting uh, and would be, um, far more interesting and be, it would be, it would just be so much better instead of it just being kind of a thing where you're like, Oh yeah, I guess I'll just assign him to my biggest city that makes the most money because that's all he's good for is adding to the income. Instead, it could be this interesting thing of like, Oh yeah, I'm going to like, he's going to sit home in my city, but I, you know, I really, do I want him in the place that makes the most money? so that he's just there like providing buffs to income and like some of his skills could focus that like do you want him to be a military character where he's really focused on your garrison or do you want to focus his skills more into like his blue tree which are all about buffing the city and the province that he's in so you could have like his blue tree skills be stuff like increase income provided by industry buildings or in increase income provided by farms or you know, increase corruption, anti-corruption, increase control. Maybe he has a skill that when he uses it, he uh, increases the move campaign movement of anyone that starts in that province by 20%. So he's like, uh, you know, sending out supplies to help armies that are passing through. Or he greatly increases casualty replenishment for allies in his province. Like there are a lot of ways to make the Adaman a really fun and engaging character. Um, 
more than he is now certainly so like allow him to have a skill tree allow him defending a city to grant him passive experience gain uh, but like you know maybe have a system where uh he watches over a city and he can recruit an army but he's you know he doesn't count for supply lines and he's got 100 percent upkeep production as long as he is garrisoned but the second he walks out of the garrison you know, all those penalties come in and he loses the vast majority of his buffs. So you're heavily incentivized to keep him in a city. Uh, but, you know, if there's someone like out raiding nearby, you know, they're like killing the peasantry and uh, attacking the ungol villages and burning the farms. Well, then he should, you know, go out there and deal with them, um, which w I think would be a lot of fun. You know, maybe he could have a unique gimmick where he's able to, you know, instead of him building an army, Maybe it could be that there's a unique button you have. Uh, like we, we've seen with uh, Yuan Bo, right? Yuan Bo has an ability now where he could recruit the garrison of a city. So he just turns the garrison into an army. So what if this boyar could do that? Like you use this ability where he immediately like spawns with the entire garrison as an army and can run out and go fight, but that army cannot replenish uh, and it only lasts for like five turns and once it's dead, it returns to the garrison. You know, something like that. I don't know. Uh, I, I think there are ways you can play around with it and have a lot of fun. Moving on to Devotion. So Devotion is a fine resource mechanic. However, Devotion is kind of not super useful anymore um, in that they've made two very dramatic changes which is that first you do not need devotion to build anymore. It used to be for Kislev that all of the landmark buildings and the orthodoxy churches cost devotion to construct. Well, that's no longer the case. So now devotion can only do two things. Uh, number one is that you can use it for your uh, the invocations to the four Kislevite gods, which is fine. That's great. That's cool. That's awesome. Uh, you can use it for four techs in the tech tree, which basically just buff your four invocations. That's also fine. And then if you take a province that is made entirely out of chaos waste terrain, you can activate uh, a unique commandment um, within that province that basically gets rid of all of the negative effects for chaos terrain or like lowers them or whatever. Um, I, it, yeah, it gets rid of the negative effects for being in hostile terrain. Uh, but it costs you devotion every turn, uh, which I really, really like that effect. I think that's really cool that you can spend that resource to activate a unique commandment. That's actually a feature I would like to see way more of for like a bunch of other races, like any races that have unique resources. I would love to see far more of the idea of being able to activate unique provincial commandments um, that charge you that unique resource. I think that's actually super cool. However, when it comes to devotion, um, the other thing they did is they made it where the threshold for having low devotion, which can result in chaos boys appearing and raiding your territory and attacking you, has now been set to much, much, much lower because you can go negative in devotion. But it feels like it's kind of impossible to do that um, or nearly impossible to do that because like, you generate such massive amounts of it uh, now, and you're not really going to be spending it on much. Um, so what I would recommend is add a new feature for devotion. My thought would be, uh, just add provincial edicts. Um, so the, you know, like the things that the dark elves and the chaos dwarves have where like under their provinces, they have the three buttons and you can click one of the buttons and it spends your unique resource and you get a buff. Just do that with devotion, you know, make it where, uh, you know, you can spin devotion in order to, I don't know, like speed up recruitment by a turn for armies in that province. Um, maybe allow you to use devotion to like rush construction on individual buildings. Uh, that could be a thing, or you could use it, uh, to, uh, you know, generate some income or, you know, there, there, there's a formula for it. Like, I, I don't care what else it can do, like whether you want to use it to speed up building construction or you want to add the little provincial edicts and, you know, they could, they could be kind of generic where they could just be the, like, one gives you money, one gives you higher control 
and the other one gives you, you know, whatever buff. Um, but alternatively, they could also be made to be maybe a little spicier, a little more unique. Um, I, I like Devotion. I think it's a fine resource. Uh, I like the way you earn it by, you know, like fighting Chaos Factions in particular. Um, but there just needs to be more that you can do with it, which I think would be really, really solid. Moving on to the characters. Uh, Boris, I think, is great and fine and awesome. I don't think really much needs to change about him. The only thing I think should be changed about Boris Ursus is that his starting region needs to be made Chaos Waste terrain, not Tundra um environment terrain whatever because right now so it used to be that boris um was less affected by or no he was still affected by the chaos terrain it just is that he generates devotion when he takes chaos terrain which is awesome i still love that the problem is in order to kind of like make his campaign a little easier to start they turned his starting region from chaos waste terrain to tundra or snow terrain so it's friendly to him but because they did that there is now an issue where Boris's starting province can't use the new commandment, um, which makes it uh, the provincial ability, which makes it where you get to ignore the downsides of chaos waste terrain, uh, which some people I, I've seen some people saying like, oh, why do they do that? That took away Boris's unique thing. No, I disagree immensely because the thing is, is that for uh, Katarin and Kostaltin, when they take chaos waste terrain and use that ability, yeah, they get to ignore the effects of chaos waste uh, stuff, um, like the downsides of that territory. However, it costs them, like, I think five devotion per turn um, for every province they do that in. And that can actually start to put a drain on your devotion if you're not careful. Boris, however, still has his ability where he generates devotion by taking um, chaos waste terrain locations or regions so boris instead of paying five devotion per turn he's usually paying like one devotion per turn or even net zero depending on the province uh so he basically is able to cancel out the cost because he passively generates devotion um while also spending it to get rid of the penalties but right now you can't do that in his starting province he can't activate that commandment because it has a single tundra or snow environment location. Um, and then the other three settlements in that province are all chaos waste. So he's just stuck with the negative effects so that his starting settlement can be friendly, which is not worth it at all. Um, so the only thing I would say for Boris is they should change that starting location to be chaos waste terrain, not snow terrain. Kostaltin. Uh, Kostaltin is a pretty interesting character that I like a lot, but he doesn't really have a gimmick right now. Um, like Kostaltin is very, very, very powerful. Uh, he also is kind of like a crazy wealthy character. He has some skills that actually play very nicely into your financial situation. And he starts with Erengrad. So he's like, he's kind of the money man, which he's supposed to be. If you read about the background of Kostaltin, the whole thing with him is although he kind of looks like this old dirty beggar that's like this super crazy zealot guy, while he is a crazy zealot, he's actually a lot more clever um, and savvy than he appears to be, which is that he, because he's the supreme patriarch of the great orthodoxy, he is insanely wealthy. Like, Kostaltin is one of the richest people in all of Kislev. And he puts on a whole act about how like, oh, I'm just one of you. Like, I'm just one of the, I'm just one of the regular people, you know, fighting against chaos and trying to fight the corruption of the, of all of the, you know, the boyars and the ice cord and all this other stuff. When in reality, he is a different form of corruption. Like he, although he is a very, very faithful man, he is very zealotrous and he's genuine in his zealotry. He also plays it up in a lot of ways. And he manipulates people um, by pretending to be far more down in the dumps like them when he's not at all. Um, and I think reworking his faction buffs um, so, and maybe his army buffs so that though they better reflect that aspect of his character would make him far better, especially in the long term of the campaign. Because right now, he has like a pretty 
terrible faction buff, which is that he buffs like the absolute bottom tier units. So like Kossars and uh, Kossavite Dervishes and uh, the Horse Archers. He gives them all like plus five melee attack and like plus leadership, I think, and like maybe plus melee defense, but like it's a really, really basic buff. It's not that strong and it's only for the lowest tier units which it's it's kind of helpful i guess at the start of the campaign but after that it's pretty much completely fucking useless um because it's just not that strong of a buff and nothing else that coast dalton gets for the rest of his campaign plays into that like he doesn't get any buffs um from his like personal skill tree that lean into like buffing the hell out of the little guys you know he's not like to or grom where he like takes your bottom tier basic bitch units and makes them into something like super scary powerful no he's just like he himself is a powerhouse but he doesn't really do anything for his faction other than like make more money uh, which is fitting what i would say though is that to better represent the wealth and power that he wields as supreme patriarch he should be all about kind of forwarding the technology of kislev you know carrying on the legacy of boris um, where the great orthodoxy is really wanting to drive forward with pulling away from the ice court, right? Pulling away from magic. We don't want magic supporting us. We want to rely on more mundane means to defend ourselves, more pure means to defend ourselves, by which I mean guns. Um, so I think that he should be really big about buffing black powder units. So his faction buff, instead of it being about uh, buffing like all the little guys instead his faction should focus on buffing Strozzi, armored Kossars, war sleds and little grom because those don't really have like a, a parent right now like katarin is all about the the ice guard and the ice lynxes and uh debatably Zargard. you know czar boris is Zargard uh and like bear riders and the elemental bear um, and Katarin's also a little bit of the Elemental Bear. And Kostaltin's also a little bit. The Elemental Bear is actually a really cool unit because thematically it fits every single Kislevite character, but that's a completely other discussion. And then obviously Mother Ostankia is all about her DLC units. Kostaltin doesn't really have an, a relationship with any units, but there's this big gaping hole over the Black Powder units. Nobody seems to really have much in the way of like unique buffs or a relationship with the, the War Sleds or Little Grom, or the Strelzi, or the Armored Cossars. Let that be Kostaltin's thing. Like, he's pouring wealth into vastly upgrading their equipment, into, you know, having the Orthodoxy perform blessings on it, so that the, you know, the Kislevite Pantheon is uh, blessing them with further power. You know, Dawes blesses uh, their Black Powder, so it's more explosive. Uh, Urson blesses, uh, you know, their... Their various sleds and stuff so that they literally like sap the heat out of the air around them and uh, hurt people or slow them down further. Uh, Soliac is, you know, uh, buffing everyone's tenacity and making them able to heal better. And then uh, Tor is like, you know, God of Thunder. He makes your big booms bigger booms. Uh, so, you know, just things like. Uh, you know, increased range, increased missile, armor piercing missile damage, increased ammunition. Uh, and I would really like to see Kostaltin's unique skill tree focus more on like faction wide buffs that he gains kind of representing the Pantheon. Uh, cause right now it's like, I don't know. He just doesn't really interact with them that much. Um, he should also probably, I don't know if he does all the time. No, I'm pretty sure he doesn't, but Kostaltin has a faction effect. I mean, he's the great orthodoxy. He should have a significant reduction um, in devotion cost to the uh, uh, to the um, the invocations of the Kislevite gods. Either that, or like maybe he should have a unique buffed versions. Like his versions are, they should probably just be cheaper, you know? Because um, I don't know, I, I think that would suit him. Like, it, yeah, it would give him a little bit of an advantage in the devotion race. But like, who who the fuck cares, right? Like, if you're the player, you can very easily cheese the supporter race to make sure you always win by just, like, spamming the appropriate buildings and spamming the appropriate hero. Um, but for Kostaltin, I would say give him, like, a 50% cost reduction or 25% cost reduction in the, um, the uh, invocations of the motherland 
give him faction wide buffs to all black powder units and maybe try to find some way in his skill tree um some of it some of the skills in his unique skill tree are pretty boring like i think one of them is like they give him I, I can't remember them off. one of them i think the very last one is like oh he gets plus two local recruitment and something like that like it's super dumb um that one should absolutely be replaced with like buffs representing the pantheon uh so you know it's like maybe Kostaltin like gives faction wide plus five additional casualty you know plus five percent additional casualty replenishment for soliac uh plus um you know uh maybe making the frostbite attacks maybe he gets like upgraded frostbite uh on units in his army uh, and maybe it could just be for his army you know to make it a little more to make it a little more appropriate because not everyone you know uh, his blessing probably wouldn't extend to the entire faction but maybe for his army you know he gets bonus casualty replenishment for soliac he gets um uh he gets uh an upgraded version of frostbite on any of the units in his army that have frostbite for urson he gets um like the discourage effect because of like how loud the booms are uh from his little grom cannons like maybe they deal discourage effect when their missile attacks hit people and then for uh for Dawes, uh he gets you know a bonus to missile damage or just flaming attacks for his entire army i don't know yeah sure fire attacks for everybody god of the sun um in any event <clears throat> that's ghost Dalton. i think there's plenty of ideas there to help make him feel much better um because the whole thing with Kostaltin, excuse me, the whole thing with Kostaltin should be that he is all about having a significant amount of power and control in that he has a theme of like, he pretends to be poor. He depends, he, you know, he pretends to be among the common man and is just like this poor wild zealot who's fighting the good fight, no matter what it personally costs him. But in reality, there is incredible wealth and cunning behind the firebrand attitude. Um, now, as far as like that bonus to basic bitch Kossars and stuff, that could still be a thing. You know, that, that could still maybe be a faction effect. I don't think it's powerful enough to like warrant getting rid of it. I guess you could keep it, but it's just I, it, it, it's just not that great. It's just not that great. I just don't find it interesting. Um, but I, I think that would go a long way to making Kostaltin feel much better. And then last, but certainly not least, Katarin. So, uh, Katarin, the more I think about it, I don't know if this would be optimal. <laughs> like, I, I don't, it could very well be that I'm going to say what I'm about to say. And there are people who play multiplayer Kiss Level a lot and they're going to be like, oh no, that's a terrible idea. Um, but I also don't think Katarin's that meta, so I'm not that worried about it. But I think Katarin, to help make her feel more unique and stand out better, Katarin should be given a mixed lore. Um, because she's supposed to be the most powerful of the Ice Witches. Like, she is the most powerful Ice Witch to ever live, with the exception of Mishka, who was the very first one. Um, so, give I would say give her a mix of the lore of Tempest and the lore of Ice. Because, like, traditionally, we use mixed lores to demonstrate that a caster is, like, a bigger badass than you know just the single lore casters i don't know if that's always like the best but i do like the theming of it so i say give give counter into mixed lore I, I think there's a lot of fun to be had in that and you know if you choose the right spells potentially it could even make her a lot stronger um so give her a mixed lore and then the other thing is for the love of god can we please get katarin's ice sled please please it, okay let's if we take the bear technology the, the bear war sled technology and we take the hag sled technology and we put them together we get Katarin's ice sled you know give me give me a sled that's got all the cool ice effects on it and it's it's not super rickety like it's really nice and ostentatious looking um but instead of it being pulled by bears it's pulled by white ice reindeer so like they're white reindeer so they're the reindeer from the hag models but they're white you know they're like they're they're pure white and they've got like frost effects playing around their antlers and their hooves or whatever um and you did it like that's all you can so just just take the bear sled and the the indrika deer elk critters and put them together and smack katarin's big booty on there and we're done we're good we're awesome 
uh, please, please give Katarin her sled. Um, I it bothers me so much that she does not have her sled. Um, I want it. I want it very bad. It would help her stand out so much more than anything else and it would be such a cool unique thing and like she has all these really cool animations on her infantry model like her infantry model has all these super badass animations where like when she's in combat she like throws her scepter and her sword around and like ice magic is like and it's like shooting people all over the place and it's like cool and then she gets on her mounts and she doesn't do anything after that um you know it would be awesome to see her be much more like uh ostankia and the hag witches where she's like using her ice magic animations so she's like summoning ice to like blow up people and stuff um that seems completely feasible and would be super awesome and kick-ass please 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 do that um the rest of these changes i think are extremely minor uh and should absolutely be done like the most difficult change would probably be be um reworking the ice court system so that it's unique for every character but i think that would be absolutely worth the effort so that is going to wrap up today's video uh, on how to make Kislev into a genuinely super fun race slash faction. Uh, please let me know what y'all think in the description down below. Uh, if the, you liked all these ideas, if you hated any of them, if you loved one of them but not others, or if there's ideas that you think uh, should be approached that I did not talk about, uh, do let me know. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.